All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here at Marine Science Day online. We're just so excited to have you here. We are coming to you live from Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center located in Newport, Oregon. And my name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the research program manager and I will be your host. Uh, this is our second live lab exploration. So we are really excited to take you into one of our new lab spaces. But before we get started, a couple of quick questions. Um, our quick uh, announcements, this is a webinar format, so your mics, camera, and screen shares have been disabled, but please use either the chat or the question and uh, answer boxes to put in any questions you might have, um, and we will work through them as they come in, so no need to wait until the end. We will work through those questions as they come in. I also wanted to let you know that we are recording this event, so it will be posted on the um, event page in a couple of days. I also just wanted to address an issue that's coming up. If you are trying to get into the live animal interaction and you're having a little bit of trouble, there's a little tiny button that says click uh, a link for attendees. If you click that, you should be able to bypass any need to sign in. So if you would like to attend one of those, try that method to get in. Um, okay, so for today in our next event, I just want to introduce Drummond Biles. He is the manager of Hatfield's Innovation Lab or the iLab. The mission of the iLab is to serve the maritime community and provide a hub for creativity exploration where ideas can be designed and built. This lab is a vast workshop filled with equipment for electro um, engineering, for mechanic, welding, fabrication, 3D design, modeling, printing, uh, uh, laser cutting, all sorts of great things. Um, and Drummond's going to show you around this space here in just a second. Drummond has his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of New Hampshire and joined the Hatfield team um, in the fall of 2021. So Drummond, the floor is yours. Take it away. And hello, welcome to the Innovation Lab, our local innovative space here at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. So we are inside the new Marine Science Building and in the front of this building is the Innovation Lab. As Cinnamon just alluded to, this is the lab where we think about designing, building, creating, testing, and all the components that we need to support that for developing what our researchers need. We just saw a great live event previously with Debbie upstairs in the genetics lab. They've been a wonderful partner down here in this space. We've had a really good time actually building some equipment for them. So being able to support our researchers in all the questions that they're trying to answer, as well as being able to teach the students that come through this space, fabrication skills, design skills, and all the components that will support the research that we're trying to do and the future questions that we're trying to answer. So this space is a broad workshop, as Cinnamon alluded to, with lots of different tools to support all these different components. What we're gonna to use today is one small design and build example that'll walk us through the process that we use here in design thinking and problem solving, and then the actual fabrication tools that we have here in the machine shop floor. So to give the backstory for the kind of project that we're gonna be looking at, <clears throat> we were working with some researchers who were trying to look at the sand at about hundred meters depth off of our Oregon coast. Now the way they do this is by using a system called a box core. What this is doing is it's being deployed via a winch off the side of the boat. It's being dropped roughly hundred meters down and then it takes a sampling of sand and pulls that back up onto the boat. Now they want this for a number of reasons, the composition of the sand, as well as some of the organic life that's sitting in that top roughly 10 centimeters or so in sand. Now, some of the challenges that they were having is that the system would not deploy well, it wouldn't come up right with the amount of sand that they needed, or it simply didn't actuate at all. And the challenge is you're trying to understand something that's happening 100 meters beneath you. You have no viewpoint into that. You don't know what's going on with that system. So we work with them to do a small design and build of a sensor that they could mount onto their box core and would help inform them what was happening to the system as it was traveling down, down, down through the water. So let's take a look at that system. So 
so the system that we came up with is this here. So this is a small pressure enclosure which seals this system. This is a microcontroller as well as the measurement unit. So this small little black chip here is actually what's doing all the things that we're interested in. And what we had to do, unfortunately, we can't just throw that right into the ocean and mount it on something and have it come back up. A, it really doesn't like salt water. And B, it has no way to talk to anything else. It has no way to save any of the data. So we need to have all of these supporting systems that allow us to protect it from our harsh environments that we're trying to work in and then save the data in a way that we can understand it. So this whole enclosure or this system that we're looking at here is what protects it from the water and seals it to keep it dry down to the depth that we're looking at. Uh, and then the inside electronics are what coordinate everything together. So what we're going to start with is first the design of this system. So I'm going to share my screen from the computer that I'm working at right here. And let's share, uh, let's see, I'll share this screen. And hopefully everybody uh, who can yes, share, yeah, can wonderful. So now you've seen the physical system here and now you can see the 3D model. So when we think about designing systems, we first start by modeling everything on the computer. So this gray box represents this aluminum housing and these black components represent the printed structures that we use it to mount to the instrument that we were looking at. So we start by designing all of this system here. We hide a few of these so we can take a deeper look into it and getting everything working on a computer. What that allows us to do is be really confident in the way that the system will operate before we go to use it. All right, that should go away. There we go. So now we can see these are the electrical components that are sitting inside the box here. Uh, this is the enclosure. An O-ring sits in here. That's that black piece here that helps seal the whole thing. And so once we're confident in the design that we have on the computer, we feel it'll achieve the mission that we've set out for. It'll seal at the right depth. It'll do everything we're looking for. We now have to think about taking the system from the computer and communicating it to the machines that we have in here to be able to actually make the system. And so there's two different forms of fabrication or two different styles of fabrication that we use in this system. One was CNC milling. So it's computer numerically controlled milling machine that we're gonna take a look at. And that's what allows us to carve out all of this aluminum in here. The other one was 3D printing. That's what allows us, let me bring this into the, there we go. That's what allows us to, Oh, that's a machine saying hello. I mean, it's, it's a little impatient. It wants us to come over and say hi, but we will. 3D printing for the enclosure that we're working on. So those two pieces, let's take a look at how we're communicating from the computer, that design to the actual machines. So the first one we talked Before about was that- Before we go there, Drummond, a question. Um, absolutely. Why a rectangular housing instead of something more cylindrical? That's a great question. Uh, from the boards that we were working at, we were trying to use that rectangular shape. So it really became a form factor of the system we were trying to enclose. It's very common to use cylindrical systems as well. Cylindrical, as this person probably uh, is familiar with, is actually a better system at dealing with higher pressures. But because we weren't going too deep, we utilized the resources that we had here and the boards that we were trying to enclose. Uh, but certainly if you're going to much deeper systems, you're gonna use that cylindrical form factor because it's a much better system at being able to uniformly deal with external stress or the pressures that we would see at deep ocean. Great question. So a follow up on that same question, how do you calculate yeah. and test for the pressure of the various materials you're gonna use for your housings? Yeah, so there's a number of modeling steps that we do. Uh, fortunately, I don't have those loaded up here, but we go through a full exhaustive design analysis in this actual computer program here where we model the pressures that we're gonna see. So we go to say hundred meters, we then calculate the resulting PSI, pounds per square inch, that results at that depth. We then use the computer to simulate the stress that would come from that. 
And so we make sure that the aluminum enclosure rule work doesn't implode, doesn't buckle. We also make sure that the O-ring that we're using, this ceiling structure, uh, has the right uh, compression associated with it to be able to seal these two halves together. That's a very good thing, and it's something we think a whole lot about, and it's a really interesting question that we're always trying to work on. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Great questions. Thank you all. Please keep them coming. So what we're thinking about here is we need to cut out this shape. And so what we do is we communicate to the machine where we want it to go. And so we're going to start as just this big rectangle, but we need to go down to this final shape. And so these blue lines represent where the machine will actually travel. And so let's just try a quick simulation here. And this is modeling what the machine will be doing to actually cut away that material. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the machine, but that moving piece there that you see on your screen is the actual tool that the machine is using to cut away the metal. The other technique that we were talking about is 3D printing. And so this form of manufacturing we're taking material away. The other form that we use in this project was adding material or additive manufacturing. And so that's this part, this part that sits up on top here. This is a 3D printed component. And so we build this or push this to another program that then communicates how on a 3D printer, let me hide this here, you know, hide all my toolbars, excuse me. Uh, there we are, how to, actually add material. So this one, you can see the funny thing is this one's adding material instead of removing material. So two different techniques that we use based on the type of design that we're trying to accomplish and the goals of the actual uh, end product. Uh, we use both of these techniques throughout all of our designs that we're working on in here as they each have their own kind of specialty. So let's now, actually I'll pause in case there's any other questions before we go over and actually take a look at one of the machines. Yeah, can you stop sharing and zoom into the actual um, device on the table one more time for us before you leave it? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the system that we're looking at. We're looking at that computer design. Uh, and this is the final system that, uh, well, this isn't the one that got deployed, uh, but the, the other one just came back. Uh, looks like we got some good data from it and we'll be breaking into that on Monday. Great, thank you so much, Drummond. You're welcome. Okay, so now we're going to travel over to one of the machines. I'll take this computer with me because we will play with it later. So there's other tools that sit into these other areas that we won't have time to talk about today, whether it's welding, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's other metal form or uh, metal machining techniques. But this is a machine that we use to make that enclosure. So this system, I know it's, it's rather needy, but this system is a CNC, so computer numerically controlled milling machine. It uses these tools up in here. Let's actually pull one of these tools in. Okay, um, we're gonna, we are doing it live. Um, T5, I think. So we're gonna go to tool five. Oh, no, don't want that. Excuse me, M6 T5. Let's go there. Okay, so let's pull in one of these tools. It's gonna to change over. And this we can now take a look at, that's one of the milling tools that it actually uses to cut away material. So we load that program that we were looking at from the computer into here, hit go. And if we've done all of our appropriate homework and all of our calculations right, we then get the right enclosure out of here. Again, we're thinking about removing material. So Cinnamon, if you can go ahead and play uh, the shortened video that we have that we recorded while we were making one of these, we can then talk from that. Wonderful. So this is an image of a GoPro sitting inside our milling machine. Right, you gotta be happy when you're working on systems like this. Uh, and this is the start of one of those programs. You can see there's coolant being pushed onto the tool itself. That helps keep the whole system nice and cool and happy as it's cutting away all of that metal. And if I'm looking up above, it's simply because I'm watching it so I can talk to you about it. And you can see that table move around as it's moving where everything is cutting. Wonderful. And that's a time-lapse sped up version of it. So it's not actually going as quickly as it looked. That's about a 
Uh, I think it took about an hour process. We run things a little bit slower here simply because we're pretty friendly to our tooling. Um, we are not a factory production floor. We are a learning space where we do kind of one-off prototypes and systems. So I will pause there again for any other questions around this machine. All right, everybody online, you got to help me out here. Any questions that you might have, put them into the chat or put them into the question and answer. We have plenty more to look at, so no worries. And we can always come back if there are future questions about any of these systems. So we've talked about the design work. We've talked about the fabrication that goes into making the enclosure. The next piece that we're going to look at is the electronics. Before Again, you leave please. that piece of equipment, um, can yes, you tell please. us how much money a device like this CNC <laughs> machine costs? Certainly. You know, I was, let's play the same game because I think Debbie did a wonderful job earlier. Let's play the same game. If we're to go from zero to $100,000 is our, is our estimated range, say, what would a system like this cost? It's relatively small. Uh, but it is very capable system. So maybe we'll uh, wait for a few guesses. We can wander over into the next area and then we can uh, take a look into the poll and I'll answer that question. Okay, before you leave that, what happens if we run out of coolant while we're running uh, one of your cuts? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the system is actually smart enough that it'll warn me before it runs out. Uh, simply like an oil light on your car, it's gonna tell you, hey, we're getting close. You need to do something here. Uh, so it really won't run out unless I'm really not paying attention to it. If that were to run out, you certainly could run this system without coolant. Um, it would be mad at you. Uh, and what it would end up happening is it's very important that your diameter, so the size of that tool stays consistent because you're trying to cut away material in a known shape. So can, you can imagine if you change the diameter to something smaller, i.e. the tool wore some, you then aren't cutting away as much material as you would imagine. So what happens if you didn't have coolant and you're running a long job, you would start to change the material that you thought you were taking away. And so you would end up with something that didn't represent what you thought you were gonna get. Um, so one, hopefully that doesn't happen, but two, it would still operate. It just wouldn't result in what we would hope and have a shorter lifespan of a lot of the systems. We're getting some guesses about the cost of the machine that are running all over the place. Um, so um, some are very detailed and some are, uh, yeah, as no, high I, as 250K. <laughs> so why don't you give us a number for it? I will admit, I do not have the quote sitting in front of me for this system, uh, but I believe it was in the neighborhood of $40,000. Um, so uh, I highly encourage if you have the space and the power in your own home garage to get one of these systems and learn it, I'll come, well, maybe I won't say that, but you, Bell, if you put one in your garage, I'll come help you with it. Okay, so now we're gonna go over to the electronics shop. It's really, all the systems that we're thinking about here are trying to protect the electronics that we've built so that they can perform their job without getting interrupted. So in this space, ah, the lights just come on, wonderful we then think about electronic design. And so this is where we prototype systems. So we start with systems on what's called a breadboard. This is a series of kind of connected and pluggable places that we can connect everything with wires. And then we go to that board that we were looking at before. That's kind of the, the second step in how you would prototype some electronics. Now, let me share my screen again, and hopefully I can give you an example of what this actually looks like. Okay, so that's the 3D printed part. So if we come into here, I will try and minimize some things so we don't get too distracted. Drummond, uh, while you're talking about 3D absolutely. printer, that's, I had a question a little earlier about what's the difference between a 3D printer you can buy online and the one that you use for the work that you do? Absolutely. Well, I will say all the ones that we have bought here, we bought online. Um, and we have a variety of systems. I would say the big difference is the types of materials you can print and the robust nature of the printers. How many times is it gonna break down? How, much, how long can you run it before you have an issue? Um, and in our prototyping shop here, we have a range of systems from thousand dollar machines that we do a lot of stuff on and repair a lot and work a lot with that are something you probably could also have in your home if that 
it was a system you wanted to much more expensive systems that embed carbon fiber or other more uh, engineering grade materials. So we use a range of systems here. Great, thank you. Yeah, so we plugged in the system. It's now got some lights going on on it. And what we're gonna do is hopefully, huh? doesn't like that. So let's, so this is a big piece um, of these electronics and that we're prototyping everything. Everything is a, is a dance to get the system working appropriately, functioning appropriately and being robust for those field deployments. Um, so there's many a time that we're working with a system and we end up having to do a lot of troubleshooting on that. So I'm hoping that this will work, but many a times it does not. Um, let me, well, we are doing it live. So um, for some reason it doesn't wanna communicate right now. And that is a huge part of the problems that we work on here. As you can see, this is actually the code that that system is running. Um, and it's currently still trying to upload, even though that piece isn't connected. So I let's let's I will I will not leave us there yet. We are gonna just try and see if we can reload that to get our system up and running. And you shall see my file architecture. I promise it's pretty neat. Um, oh, that's not. Let me stop sharing for a moment. Find this system because we have about. 10 minutes left to open up any questions here while I try and locate this file and we'll see if we yeah. can't get this system up and running. We're definitely getting some questions here. Great. Can you talk to us about who gets to use all this equipment? That's a great question. So I certainly manage and run this whole space, uh, but what I look to do is encourage student participation throughout this space. So I have OSU students in this space. I have uh, OSU and Hatfield researchers in this space. We even are starting to have some community partners that are working with us in this space. So it's really a shared resource for Hatfield and for OSU. Um, That's a another, great question. Another question came in is what are, like for the example that you're showing us, what is the cost of creating that box for the core? Absolutely, that's a good question. And so what we think about a whole lot is low cost accessible items to really try and enhance who's able to leverage these tools and who's able to do some of this science. And so when we think about the electronic side of things, the cost of these are tens of dollars. We're looking in the neighborhood about uh, $40 of components. When we think about the metal housing, that's really where a lot of that uh, financial burden comes in because there's a lot of design work that needs to happen there. There's also a lot of time spent on those machines. So uh, that that is really where that becomes a challenge. And so it, I'd say a couple hundred dollars is kind of the neighborhood of where we're looking at. Great. And you might need to give us a little background on this one, but we have a question that says, I assume this is C++. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are speaking English currently. All of the machines that we're looking at have their own language. Unfortunately, they're not English. I would love to be able to talk to this uh, microcontroller that we're looking at in English. That would be wonderful, um, but we're not able to. So they all have their own language that they use to understand what we're asking them to do. Uh, and so the uh, code that we were looking at, and I'm still trying to troubleshoot a little bit here, uh, is C++. That's a great example of, of what we're working with here. Um, and what we what we use. There's lots of different code that we use in here. Python is also another one that people may be familiar with uh, that we use a lot. Um, and, and there's uh, M code and G code. That's the systems that we're looking at in that milling machine. Um, and yes, so good question. Um, since we're having a little trouble getting the coding to work, um, mm -hmm. what other type of projects have you completed in the innovation lab since you've been at Hatfield? Absolutely. And I will, let's, I can spend the rest of the day debugging this. So let's just go back out on the floor and talk about questions and really utilize this live structure to engage with the rest of the questions. You come back later, come get a coffee in the Marine Science Building and we'll chat about this project and I'll show you how cool it is. So another project that we worked on that I think ties in nicely with some of the other things that we've thought about today has been a drone project. And so an example, one of the drones that the, uh, that I call them the whale people, 
Every, all our friends up on the third floor use a whole lot. Uh, and the Marine Mammal Institute are these drones. And these drones are systems that they're using to survey the whales. So they're flying them up above them. And so we've worked, uh, fortunately we don't have the system in here now because it's out in the field right now. But we work to help outfit these drones with some LIDARs. That's a laser ranging system uh, for those projects. And that was a really fun project. We worked with a number of grad students there on upgrading some of these drones and kind of really being able to help advance what the researchers can do with those drones. Uh, there's other projects that we're working on with NOAA a lot of them involve cameras. A lot of them actually are involving DNA. We're seeing a lot of work that's coupling the things that we can do in the field to the things that we just saw Debbie talk, talk about up above with trying to sequence uh, and collect the DNA from the animals we're interested in. Great question. Um, so we have a few more minutes, but we're getting close One. to the end of our time. But we got a question about, I saw somewhere that there was a shared artist studio as part of the Innovation Lab. Um, yeah. Are there any collaborative art projects happening there now? So there is one project that's been throughout this building that's a wonderful art display. I highly encourage everybody to come and visit Newport and the Marine Studies building here. And it's throughout the building, the first and second floor. That's the first example of one of the art projects that we've had here. We have an artist studio up above here that we're working to get some summer residency programs going in. And um, we're just working on the programming side of that. So we, we haven't had locally from here yet, but we certainly have a number of different projects that we're looking to display in this building. And it's a really wonderful side of the creation that this building is working to encourage and create more space for. Um, you're getting some love about how difficult it is to debug code, so I'll just say that out loud. <laughs> Thank um, you. I much appreciate it. I swear I had it working this morning, but I guess I didn't give it enough coffee, so oh well, I'll go pour some more on it. It'll work fine. As soon as y'all leave, though, you know it's going to run. <laughs> um, so do you train students to use these tools? You kind of address that a little bit, but can you go a little bit more in depth? Absolutely. I train many students to address these tools. I'll, I'll back up and say we really opened our doors in about January of this year. So we're trying to understand what are the best ways and methods that we can bring students out to here and couple the training that we have in this space with the classwork that they're already doing. So the short answer is yes. The longer answer is it's coming to a program near you. Great. Um... So Yi Chung, can you stop sharing the um, drone for a second? Yes. And I can't talk directly to our camera folks, so. That's okay, I use hand signals to coordinate <laughs> what we're doing. And um, I just wanted to see, is there um, any other questions coming in from online that we wanna take a little time with? Hang on just a second. No worries. Do you know, and this is a little bit outside of your expertise, I think, but do you know other things that drones are used for in marine science? Let's see. I honestly hadn't interacted with too many drones before I came into this space. So I've really only engaged with the Marine Mammal Institute in the way that they've used their drones for being able to capture really high fidelity, so really nice pictures and videos of them. Now, what I found interesting there is, although that seems to be one space that you use to look at the whales, their ability to pull way more than I thought of out of just a video has been amazing. So, okay, you think you just have a video, but now you can get how hard is it working? How fast is it swimming? How healthy is it? What is its side? All of these factors that simply just come from an image of it. So. The shorter answer of that is, no, I only know the things that I've worked on thus far, uh, but the longer form is that what they can get from a simple picture is amazing. Great. So Drummond, we have just a minute left. Any last things that you want to tell the folks that have joined us today here online? So just love to say, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to come join us on Zoom on a Saturday. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate our ability to engage with a water group wider group. Uh, I encourage everybody to come down to the Marine Studies building. We have a wonderful cafe here. We have the visitor center as well that you can check out online and register with. Um, 
And I'm being given another question. How far can a drone be from the operator and still have real-time data transmission for video and the like? So that's more of a function of the drone itself. Um, now for drone legislation, I'm not a drone operator. I don't fly them. But my understanding is you have to be in the viewpoint of them at all times to be able to see the system. For all the systems that we built, we actually store all the data locally. Um, so we store it locally onto its own uh, card because we don't do data transmission yet. That might be something we do in the future, um, but that's really a function of the drone that you're using. Um, All right, everybody. Uh, I think I'm going to interrupt Drummond there. I know more questions are coming in, but for everybody online, you've got a few minutes to get yourself over to the last animal interaction about tide pool sculpins. Remember, if you go to the live um, events tab that Shannon can put a link into the chat for us, I believe. Um, if you're having any trouble getting into those uh, sessions, make sure you click the for attendees link um, and you'll be able to get in there. For everybody else, you are welcome to go explore the rest of Marine Science Day's event page. Um, and then we have one other um, lab interaction and that'll be a shark dissection at 1.15. So make sure you hang in there with us, keep exploring um, and uh, enjoy Marine Science Day to its fullest. Uh, everybody is saying thanks, Drummond. I say thank you. Um, and for everybody, uh, we'll see you somewhere else in this virtual world um, in the next couple hours. So enjoy. Thank you, Drummond. Hey.